This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Blockbuster growth. The economy adds the most jobs in nearly a year. Does that make an interest rate increase next month a foregone conclusion? On the hunt, this week's Market Monitor says now is the time to look for value. He's got three names for your portfolio. And Windows of the Soul, how a new eye test can help doctors take some of the mystery out of diagnosing concussions. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Friday, November the 6th. And we bid you a good evening, everybody. I'm Bill Griffith, in for Tyler Matheson tonight. And I'm Sharon Epperson, in for Sue Herrera. So much for the slump. After a few months of disappointing jobs growth, today's October employment report was anything but. In fact, it was the best number of 2015. Employers added 271,000 jobs last month. That's about 90,000 more than economists were expecting. The unemployment rate inched lower to 5 percent. Ham Hampton Pearson digs into the numbers. The blockbuster October jobs report produced the biggest monthly increase in new jobs in nearly a year and saw the headline unemployment rate drop to 5 percent, the lowest in seven and a half years. You can try to spin it some other way, but it is really good news. I think this is good news. If the Fed goes a quarter point, I don't think that kills the economy long from it. The rebound in job growth even prompted a leading Federal Reserve dove, those monetary policymakers not in a rush to raise rates, to now say the first hike in nearly a decade could indeed happen in December. I've said for, you know, quite some time that, you know, the real side of the economy is looking a lot better. We've seen substantial improvement in the labor market supported by our policy actions. And the other branch of this is, do we have confidence that inflation is going to get up to 2 percent? In October, the private sector added 268,000 new workers and job gains were widespread, including 189,000 service sector jobs with big gains in professional services, health care, retail and restaurants. Construction had its biggest gain in eight months, adding 31,000 new workers. Average earnings, now at just over $25 an hour, have gone up 2.5 percent in the last 12 months, the biggest hike in six years. Labor Secretary Thomas Perez says employers in many parts of the country are raising wages voluntarily as the job market tightens. The cost of attrition, the cost of training someone a new job is significant. And that's why the employers I talk to who've been raising their wages voluntarily they understand that it's the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do, and that high road is indeed the smart road. Two soft spots in the labor market, manufacturing being hurt by the strong dollar and energy still making cuts in drilling and exploration due to lower oil prices. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hampton Pearson in Washington. Well, let's turn now to two of our guests tonight who have opposing views on what today's jobs data mean for a rate hike next month at the Federal Reserve meeting. Bricklin Dwyer is senior economist at BNP Paribas. He says the likelihood of a December rate hike has gone up now. Josh Bivens, economist and policy director at the Economic Policy Institute, says not so fast. Bricklin, make the case. Uh, I guess this jobs report, you agree with Charlie Evans. It means maybe things are starting to pick up enough now, huh? Yeah, well, you know, even last month, you know, the Fed was saying that with the three-month average of payrolls or the last two months averaging about 145,000 jobs per month, that was good enough. We heard from the Fed that they're ready to hike rates. Now we got this gangbusters number, which just tells them that, hey, the labor market is there. Not just that, it came with wage increases as well. But, Josh, you say not so fast that we're looking at, need to look at all of the labor market and including those 25 to 54 where we're not seeing that much growth. Yeah, I think the real issue is it's one month. It was a really good month. If we had a lot more months like this over the past six years, we'd have already had liftoff. Um, I think it's too early. You look at the three-month average of job growth, it's a little less than 190,000. Doesn't look that different from other three-month uh, periods in the recovery. And the wage number, which got people justifiably excited that it's going up, 2.5 percent nominal growth over the year, that's still well short of what nominal wage growth would be in a healthy economy, like more than a percentage point south of that. So I would a couple more months like this before I would be really on board a rate hike for sure. Josh, what is your fear? If they raised rates in December, do we risk a recession? Is that the big fear? 
I think we risk a, a slowing of what is shaping up to be a, a decent recovery. And it's much, much easier for the Fed to restrain an economy that's overheating by raising rates than to boost an economy that has started to go south by lowering rates because we're already at zero. And so given that huge asymmetry and risks facing us ahead of time, I think we want to make sure we have actually achieved escape velocity before we start raising rates. Do you think we're there, though, Brooklyn? You think we're, we're already ready to do this? Yeah, well, the Fed is looking at the stock of progress, not just the pace. So, you know, they're looking at the total amount of jobs created, which, you know, we can debate all day long about whether the unemployment rate is representative where the economy is right now. But it's giving a signal that a lot of people have jobs and they're keeping jobs. And so what that's telling you is that we should start to see inflation and wages rise. You know, I think one of the points that was just made about wages starting to increase you know, wages aren't supposed to increase till the economy is at full employment or some level of employment where, you know, there's some natural, everybody has a job that's supposed to have a job idea. And then they ask for more money. And when they ask for more money, that's when inflation starts to pick up. The Fed has to be ahead of that curve, not behind it. But you know, Brooklyn, what's happened in the past, every time they start making noises that they are thinking seriously about raising rates, the dollar goes up, and that's happened recently. Commodity prices go down, and most importantly, that means energy costs go down. And then we don't get the inflation numbers that they're looking for, and they don't end up raising rates. Could that happen again? Uh, it certainly could. You know, there, there's a bit of a cat and mouse game here, which is, you know, the dollar appreciating is that in anticipation of what the Fed is already going to deliver. You know, so obviously the Fed can't react too much to the appreciation in the dollar because it's in response to expectations for their own policy. And then, of course, the other side of that is. You know, a decline in energy prices is a net benefit for the majority of Americans. You know, certainly there are a lot of people who suffer job losses and things like that in energy related industries, but it's a net positive in terms of demand and ultimately a net positive for the inflation outlook. Josh, in light of the dollar and commodity prices, where do you see the Fed moving? When do you see them moving? I think there's a good chance they do uh, the rate increase in December. That that would be a mistake in my view. But about a week ago, I thought it was less than 50-50. We'd see a December increase. Now it's, I think, more like 70-30 that we will. Like I said, I, th I think that's premature given the asymmetry of risks going ahead of us. But I actually kind of do expect it at this point. But you do have other central banks around the world, the ECB and others that are talking more dovish. They're talking about adding liquidity, not taking it away at this point. Does that complicate things for our Fed here, Josh? I think it does. I mean, the, the United States economy is a big part of the global economy. It also runs a big trade deficit, which means we're kind of a consumer of last resort for a lot of the global economy. And so if you've got the rest of the industrialized world, especially Europe and Japan, growing slower than they'd like, um, I think you want to be really sure we're not shutting off one source of demand growth for those countries as well. So I think that's surely got to be on the minds of Fed policymakers, too. All right. Brickland Dwyer with the BMP Paribas, Josh Bivens with the Economic Policy Institute. Thank you both tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Stocks ended the day little changed after that strong jobs report. Gains in financials offset a big drop in utilities, which is an interest rate sensitive sector. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 46 points to 17,910. The Nasdaq was 19 points higher. The S&P 500 was off a fraction of a point. For the week, the Dow and the Nasdaq were more than 1 percent higher, the S&P up nearly 1 percent. The yield on the benchmark 10-year bond rose today to a five-year high after the jobs report made a December rate hike look more likely. Meantime, President Obama announced today he has rejected the request from the Canadian energy giant TransCanada to build that controversial Keystone pipeline. The president said that the project would not be in the country's best interest and would not make a meaningful long-term contribution to our economy. For years, the Keystone Pipeline has occupied what I frankly consider an overinflated role in our political discourse. It became a symbol too often used as a campaign cudgel by both parties rather than a serious policy matter. And all of this obscured the fact that this pipeline would neither be a silver bullet for the economy, as was promised by some, uh, nor the express lane to climate disaster proclaimed by others. Shares of TransCanada fell by 5 percent on that news today. Bill Ford has reached a tentative agreement with the United Auto Workers Union. Details haven't been released yet. The Ford deal is believed to be similar to the one General Motors workers are voting on today. Aside from raises and benefits, the key to this deal is the eventual elimination of a two-tiered wage system at U.S. plants.
Well, on this Jobs Friday, we are taking a look at growth in the additive manufacturing jobs. These are better known as 3D printing. It's a growing number of manufacturers who are seeking workers with the skill set to adjust to this new reality. Mary Thompson is at a Lockheed Martin Space Systems in Littleton, Colorado, for the latest in our ongoing series on where the jobs are. It's not rocket science. For Lockheed Martin Space Systems, using 3D printers to make parts like these propellant tanks makes financial sense. There are significant cost savings, up to 50%. 3D printing or additive manufacturing can also cut production time in half. And while the technology is decades old, Lockheed Vice President Dennis Little says there's still a lot to learn. Additive is, um, is a new journey for us. It requires new skills, it requires a brand new education. It also requires more workers. Lockheed Martin is looking to hire 120 people with 3D skills, and that means STEAM, not just STEM skills. If you're thinking in 3D, your artistic or right side should complement your left side science, technology, engineering, and math skills. Lockheed's Dave Gulbernat says that's because 3D takes inspiration from nature's efficient designs, not straight lines and right angles. You end up with a lot of parts that look like tree branches, they look like roots, they look like bone structure, they look like stalactites. Engineers use software to design products which are then printed or built by machines spraying thousands of thin layers of composite on top of one another. Good for customized parts and small scale production, Deloitte says 3D printing is a $10 billion industry for now. We're seeing rapid growth as fast as 20 to 30 percent per year with projections exceeding 20 billion dollars by the time we get to 2020. Seeing an opportunity, Metropolitan State University of Denver is launching a four-year degree next fall in advanced manufacturing with a focus on 3D. President Stephen Jordan seeing a need as the state's losing business. Those companies say there is no workforce that's already here and trained. Uh, in, in additive manufacturing. The degree is designed with input from different departments, including electrical and mechanical engineering, and from firms like Lockheed Martin. Jordan sees strong demand for his 200 future graduates, along with healthy paychecks. The industry folks have been very clear that the starting salaries for our graduates will be in the 60 to $65,000 a year range. High pay and praise for those using both sides of their brain to work in 3D. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mary Thompson in Littleton, Colorado. Coming up, don't chase the rally. At least that's what our market monitor tells us. He says why and gives us three picks he says you should make right now. Fresh off its $6 billion purchase of uh, video game maker King Digital, Activision Blizzard is holding its annual Investor Day and launching the latest installment of its Call of Duty game franchise, which, by the way, is one of the biggest franchises of all time. Julia Borston is in Anaheim, California, with a look at the company's booming business. Yeah! 25,000 video gamers are here for BlizzCon's ninth year, a sold-out event to celebrate Activision Blizzard's games with panels and presentations for fans. Kim is Roller Derby Nova. I'm the green skin from Heroes of the Storm. I am an undead warlock, a level one undead warlock. I'm actually a night elf, well, without the ears. It's also a destination for esports tournaments to determine the world champions for four different video games, competing for over a million dollars in prize money. I'm a huge fan of esports in general. Um, I love that, you know, we're creating our own niche for video games in general. This weekend's competition comes on the heels of Activision. Blizzard doubling down on the business of esports, announcing a new league and hiring the former CEO of ESPN and the NFL Network to lead it. Think about how many tens of millions of people are playing games around the world in organized competition. It's only going to grow. We have the most played franchises, generally speaking, and we want to make sure that we're appropriately celebrating the commitment our players make to that content. Activision Blizzard making another big commitment to expand its business into Hollywood. Today announcing a film and television studio to create original content based on its video game franchises. We have such rich intellectual property that it lends itself very well to storytelling. 
we're going to walk before we run. We're going to be much more development than production focused. But you know, I think we always feel like our intellectual property has so much value that it would be hard to entrust it to anybody else. Perfect. I think studios should take over that more often. Because they own the actual franchise, they own it, they breathe it, they love it. You saw with a lot of the Marvel movies when Marvel Studios take over, they put the love and effort into it and it really took off. And now Activision has more family-friendly brands to turn into movies and TV shows, with its acquisition of Candy Crush maker King announced earlier this week. So in addition to the Call of Duty movie franchise in the works, favorite social and mobile games could hit the big screen as well. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Anaheim, California. We begin this market focus with investors not liking the way men's warehouse looks. The retailer giving dismal preliminary third quarter results. The company saying it's moved away from its buy one, get three suits promotion is weighing on traffic and sales. We'll find out more when the company releases its official quarterly results in December. Shares plunge 43 percent to $22.70. Drug makers Eli Lilly and Merck disclosed they are being investigated by federal prosecutors over drug pricing practices. This comes as there has been increased attention on drug pricing, including a probe the Senate launched into the matter this week. Eli Lilly was off a fraction to $80.46. Merck fell also off slightly to $54.61. And more on that saga at Valiant Pharmaceuticals. Valiant says Goldman Sachs sold more than one million Valiant shares that were used as collateral for loans given to the drug maker's chief executive. And that helped trigger yesterday's 14 percent drop in the stock. Today's shares were nearly 4 percent higher to 81.77. Well, Medicare membership growth helped to increase Humana's earnings. Still, revenue came in below consensus, which weighed on the insurer in today's session. That stock fell by 1% to $177.24. Cigna also reported mixed quarterly results. Revenue from premiums and fees rose. The insurer hiked the low end of its operating income forecast at the same time. Shares were up 3% today to $55.87. And Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway saw its operating profit actually slip in the most recent quarter. That's the number that investors look at in this firm's report as it offers the best read of the conglomerate's performance. The company did see quarterly profit double following its recent Kraft Heinz acquisitions, though. Class B shares fell initially after the close, but during the regular session, the stock was off a fraction to $136.38. And now to our market monitor, who says individual stock selection is key in this low return environment. The last time he was on in February, he recommended Symantec, which is down 19 percent, Microsoft, which gained 25 percent, and Qualcomm, which is down about 25 percent. He's Jordan Posner, senior portfolio manager at Matrix Asset Advisors. And Jordan, thanks for being here. Pleasure. We're not, we don't have that much longer in 2015, but what is your outlook for U.S. stocks for the end of the year? Well, we think there's still chance for bouts of volatility, as we've seen in the third quarter, and then, of course, uh, over the course of October in reverse. Uh, we think that uh, earnings have come in okay, and as a result, uh, in a kind of a flat to slow growth earnings environment, that's actually been a pretty good environment for stock picking. Uh, we expect that the year will end up uh, probably in the plus mid single digit range, call it four to seven percent. Uh, for the full year 2015, and uh, we expect uh, improvement in 2016 and beyond. Now, you're a value player, so you're going to look at maybe some fallen giants. And I put uh, Harley Davidson in that category that recently said, hey, they're struggling. The currencies uh, are a headwind for them, and they've got other problems going on with their product lineup. You like that stock, though, at these price levels, I guess, huh? Well, we do. We like it a lot. The stock uh, trades at under 12 times earnings. Uh, has a dividend yield over 2%. Uh, they've started to address their problems, some of which were currency-related versus competition. Uh, they've uh, funded a program for improving their product and improving their marketing from cost cuts internally, uh, and they're buying back a lot of stock uh, through an under-levered uh, balance sheet. And now you're looking at every industry and any industry to invest in where you see value. You like an orthopedics device company. Why do you like this one? Uh, Zimmer Biomet, uh, it's one of the leaders uh, in the industry. Zimmer bought Biomet uh, a little bit less than a year ago. Uh, they've levered up in terms of their debt. They're paying, beginning to pay that down, which will pay it down uh, very rapidly. Uh, 
the earnings progression here is very clear over the course of the next couple of years. Trades at around 13 times uh, earnings, uh, and we think there's probably 25 percent upside in the stock. And then finally, the uh, the uh, giant in Teva mm -hmm. in uh, generic drugs, Teva Pharmaceuticals. You like that one as well. Right. People have been concerned about Teva because of their reliance on a drug for multiple sclerosis that's uh, been responsible for about 40 percent of their profitability. That's been more stable than people have expected. Uh, they've got a big uh, generics combination deal on the table with Allergan. Uh, this is a company where a new CEO has really stabilized uh, the business and improved the strategy. Uh, and the visibility of forward earnings uh, is very strong. Sorry. We think the company uh, has a, a very positive outlook in front of it. That new strategy is what you're looking at. Thank you, Jordan Posner with Matrix Asset Advisor for joining us. Pleasure. Up next, how a new tool that tracks your eye movement can help doctors diagnose concussions. What to watch next week. Dow component Cisco reports earnings, lots of economic data, including the producer price index and retail sales. Fed Chair Janet Yellen and Vice Chair Stanley Fisher both speaking at events, and that's what to watch next week. And finally, tonight, the number of head trauma injuries treated in emergency rooms has jumped by nearly 70 percent in the last 10 years. But concussion treatment has become increasingly controversial, too. The effects, which can linger for weeks and months, have been nearly impossible to measure until now. As Tyler Matheson tells us tonight, the bright idea for a new tool which does just that belongs to a company in Bethesda, Maryland. Katie Rothstein got a scare when she fell off a Segway during a family vacation in Paris this summer. I was fine after I sat, I sat down for like two minutes and I was really dizzy. Katie's mother, Adrian, got to her moments after it happened. A mom that was in the group pulled me aside and said she had flown over the handlebars of the Segway onto the top of her head. Katie seemed okay after that until back at home almost three weeks later, she volunteered to help a company called Right Eye test new equipment. When the report came up, I looked at it and I knew it's a unique pattern that has more to do with a concussion. Melissa Hunfulve, so a right thing, eye co-founder, has studied eye tracking for more than 15 years. Their first product, Neurovision, is a digital version of the smooth pursuit test. If you are not concussed, then your eye will move smoothly with my finger. If you are concussed, then the eye does this which is what Katie's test showed. You can see that basically she jumped from here to here. The eye tracker takes 120 pictures per second, recording eye movements. Katie was lucky. Within weeks, her tests were normal. One of the problems with concussion is being able to accurately be able to assess what's going on and then know when it's okay to go back in. Hunfulve, a former tennis pro, has studied the differences between elite athletes and weekend warriors. She learned the elites focus not only on the ball, but on their opponents as well to anticipate where the ball is going and that the elites are better at blocking out distractions. Perhaps most importantly, the differences aren't limited to athletes. So even the best, whether it's a surgeon, an athlete, military personnel, their vision will change if they're not able to control their emotions. It wasn't until late 2011 when she met entrepreneur Adam Gross on a tennis court, of course, that she found a way to turn 12 years of research into a practical application. Three years ago, we couldn't have done it. The cost and the size of the eye tracking tech itself has gone down. Together, they developed software that reduced her evaluations from weeks to mere seconds. Their team spent months listening to potential customers, the military, Major League Baseball, and eye care professionals before deciding to go ahead with Neurovision. They started to ask us, can we use it to measure things like someone's depth perception uh, or field of view or extreme eye dominance? And I looked at Melissa and the answers were yes, yes, and yes. While concussion diagnosis is a headline grabber, eye care professionals like New Jersey optometrist Leonard Press already see wide-ranging possibilities. 
the idea behind we put you on an eye chart and you read letters is really impoverished. You can have wonderful eyesight and still be having problems performing, navigating, driving, reading. So we really need to bring the technology up to the 21st century. Right Eye sees an even greater impact if it can become a faster, more cost-efficient way to help school children uncover vision disorders, because reading ability can affect graduation and even juvenile delinquency rates. There are large populations in this country where these kids are not getting screened appropriately and no one's paying attention to them. And if it impacts their ability to be successful in school, it's going to impact their ability to be successful in life. And we take that very seriously and we want to have an impact. By the way, right, a, uh, right Eye says that it expects to make additional tests called essential vision and performance vision available by the end of this year. And in case you're wondering, that young lady who shared her story about falling off the Segway, she was indeed wearing a helmet when that accident wow. occurred. I know both of your kids are young enough, they're still playing athletics. Yes, this is a very is important a story for you. Very, very important. And so many kids are, were, and their parents, of course, are worried about even if they seem fine after an accident on the court or on the field, are they really okay? This is going to be essential for those kids. Got to get them tested, that's definitely, for sure. Definitely, definitely. All right. Well, that is business, uh, Nightly Business Report for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. And I'm Sharon Epperson. Have a great weekend, everybody.